We're here for a long awaited another episode of EV Obsession here on Clean Technica. I'm Zach Shahan, CEO of Clean Technica. And it's a long story, but we have a new co host, David Havasi, who many of you should know. I hope you know. If you don't know, we have a short intro to roll out here. Play those. No, no, we're not playing anything. <laughs> Dave, David will, will give you I was going to say, you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a short video about David Havasi, Hollywood style. No, David worked at Tesla from 2012 to 2019, has enormous, wonderful insights, helped to set up the Tesla store, the Tesla market in Southwest Florida. I mean, it was was the key person or one of the key person people people who set up tesla's uh presence in southwest florida huge deal and uh before that it worked on broadway for several years for i, I think many years so uh, actually has a fascinating background in entertainment and tesla and evs and naturally having worked at tesla in the early days he has a number of friends who now work at other I don't know if I sh if I'm able to name other companies where some of your friends, your early Tesla coworkers worked, but I'll let you introduce yourself further and um, you know get rolling before we jump into some news. Great, yeah, so excited to uh, uh, to do this, Zach. Uh, Zach and I've been collaborating uh, for a while right? since like a little left of the pandemic, and and uh, of course been. Uh, a reader of Clean Techno for, for years. So uh, it's so great to collaborate with, with Zach and, and talk shop. So uh, super excited to to do it and make some cool stuff that hopefully people find insightful and interesting. <laughs> yeah, and we will be doing this actually in person. One big improvement we're going to bring to the show, we're going to do it in person with a studio. But David and his family got hit with a nasty flu which delayed our, our our launch and also uh, <laughs> made this first episode virtual because I'm not really keen to get us yeah. right now. Uh, yeah, it's like it has a bubonic plague vibe in my house right now. So I'm kind of in my back office. Yeah. <laughs> so, no. yeah so we're virtual for this one. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in person, uh, you know, moving forward. That's the plan. Yeah. yeah. But let's jump in then to, to the news. Um, let's see here. I can share my screen so we can get into the, the stories with visuals. And um, let's get to the headlines. The first story here is uh, our, my report on top automakers in terms of EV market share in the US. So we're looking at this in, in a couple of ways, uh, which I don't think anyone else does. I haven't seen this done elsewhere, where we're looking at both the market share that different brands and automotive groups have of the plug of the full electric vehicle market in the US. This is not including plug in hybrids. And we all also look at um, what share of a company's sales are pure electrics. So I think this is the most interesting way for me to, to look at the leadership in the auto industry, like who's, who's Who's putting you know the most EVs out there and relative to their total sales? So if you look at that, just right off the bat, it's surprising because I haven't seen Mercedes at the top of this chart before. But for twenty twenty, yeah, for twenty twenty three, it was Mercedes uh, by by brand Mercedes, then Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Volvo, Cadillac. So very heavy premium focus here, premium cars focus. I'll let you talk more about that. And, and then on the group stage is Mercedes Group, uh, Volkswagen Group, Geely, BMW Group, and Hyundai Kia. Uh, but really, like, Mercedes, Volkswagen Group, and Geely stand out. And, and then brand-wise, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, and uh, Volvo are, so, you know, the top five. So what, what do you think? What's going on there? Why are these brands are the ones leading the mark? And, you know, is this, is this a, are these good percentages, you know? I'm pleasantly surprised seeing Mercedes at the top. I mean, when you when you start talking about ten to twelve percent of your overall portfolio of sales, that's no small peanuts. That that is huge. That starts becoming a huge thing in the bo bottom line. That that's double digit percentage. So it's not it's no longer part of a niche part of their portfolio. So that's that's really huge. I mean, I have an EQS on my block now. One of my neighbors has one. Um, there's also a, a an uh, e-tron uh, on my block. So when you you see these 
two things jump out of me. One, the double digits of becoming part of their overall, overall portfolio. So that shows that it's not this small niche thing. This is actually contributing significantly to, the, to their overall portfolio of sales. And also, like you said, these these premium German brands. So it seems as if the, uh, the the German brands, and maybe I think part of that is because they were stung first. So Model S being at the premium price point years ago, over 10 years ago, comes onto the scene and starts eating the lunch of these brands. Because uh, that's what people in that price point, 80,000 to 100,000 were cross shopping or 100,000 plus. And all of a sudden, uh, S class, you know, S class um, Mercedes sales drop. Audi uh, uh, R7, S7 sales drop. Porsche Panamera sales drop. So they're like, oh boy. And it's just like in America, with with certain things because it's human nature you don't take action until you really have to so you don't go on a (laughs) diet until you until you get diabetes you don't yeah you don't stop smoking until you emphysema you know what i mean so when you start feeling the pain that's when you take the action so you see i think what we're seeing here is the german brands got a couple of your head start they're like we have to start incorporating this into our into our portfolio because the other brands when you start going down the line to the, um, uh, you know, even Ford, General Motors, some things that are not considered luxury brands, they didn't really start feeling the pain until Model 3 entered the scene years later. So I think that's why we're seeing a German, the German brands incorporating more into their portfolio is they've been feeling the pain the longest. Yeah. That's my theory. Yeah. yeah. We'll re- what happened? I think we'll return to that topic much later on the show. Um, with maybe Toyota and Honda, but uh, but for now, yeah. And also, I mean, Tesla sh- set up shop right there in their in their home country, in Germany. I mean, it, there's a lot that's gone into like waking them up along the way. The Dieselgate scandal, of course, with Volkswagen Group made them make a make a sharp shift from diesel, clean diesel, <laughs> always, uh, and into into electric. So it's interesting and. You know, we, we talk about these being premium brands. It's funny it's because Volkswagen is like a mass market brand in most of the world. But in the mm-hmm. U.S., it's still a small company, small brand, and it has a premium, it has a premium like image to it, doesn't it? Would you say? Correct. Yeah, it's, re- it's really interesting how prolific Volkswagen is globally. Uh, they're kind of like it, it literally translates to the people's car. I mean, that I mean, that is the. That is their brand globally, but here you're right. It's this. It's um, <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a comment on what we consider quality in the United States. It's a different bar. Where in in Germany, Volkswagen's like, of course, a car should be built with this quality, you know, and because Volkswagens are built very well. So, and then when it comes to Europe, Americans are like, wow, these cars are built so great. Where the where, you know Germans are like, well, yes, that's the way cars should be built at this level of, 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 of attention to quality. So um, yeah, but you're, but, but you are right. And, and, and like you say, you see, you see Volkswagen up there. Of course, Volkswagen is, is part of a much larger group that has a couple premium brands in its portfolio. It's, it's kind of shitting a lot of those now, but, um, but you're right. They got a kick in the pants a little earlier on because of the whole diesel gate fiasco. So they were, forced into it in an, in 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 even another way beyond uh model 3 coming in and starting to eat lunch you know but i think their lunch yeah but i think model, model s x and 3 and y were really the the key drivers of these brands going electric more oh. um i what i was going to ask when tesla said, tesla is the catalyst yeah yeah okay. i agree and okay. when you said the Model S came out, you know, over ten years ago. I was like, "Oh my, how does that feel to say that?" It's like we shouldn't mention that every time. <laughs> well, yeah, twelve years ago. So Crazy. long ago. I thought it was a few weeks ago, wasn't it? No, <laughs> it, it's it's weird that it's a been long over time a ago. It is. Yeah, over a decade it starts to get nasty. Um, but yeah, so yeah. Porsche was actually Porsche was at the top of these charts for a while. Um, so it was mm-hmm. it was one of the quickest to respond. I think because the performance angle of it too and just fewer models so one electric model could take more of the share 
Um, so it it's in, interesting, you know, now that Mercedes and Audi have more electric options, Porsche has dropped down a little bit, you know, in its ranking here. But um, but the thing that struck me is before I created this, I was noticing a lot of electric Mercedes in our area, in this Lakewood Ranch area of Florida. And, uh, and I was like, wow, Mercedes is really picking up the sales on EVs. Like I just kept seeing them, you know, they have that different grill, this kind of, uh, you know, smooth front grill. And uh, the funny thing too, they, they offer several different versions, several different options and they all, they rank, you know, you know, so they have several, none of them rank very well in the model chart because there's a bunch of options and uh same yeah, with that, Audi. That dilutes it. so you don't realize yeah. they're doing that well until you do it in this form looking at brands and and group and yeah, also you, you look at overall portfolio yeah right. yeah and you also don't notice if you're just looking at top sellers and not percentage of sales because clearly um we, we'll get to top sellers but you know the mass market brands that are doing better than others you got hyundai kia ford uh gm a bit so the I don't think it's a big surprise. Like Hyundai Kia um, has been an EV leader for years. It's it's still, it's never been nearly as ambitious as I wish it would be because I feel like it could have sold, it could have 10% EV market share if it tried, in my opinion. And it's sitting there at <laughs> four. Uh, Hyundai's at 5.9%. We'll just focus on Hyundai. And I find that a little disappointing. Like they, it could be at 10 plus. And uh, similar to Ford, like 3.8%. Well, it's doing better than some of the other brands, but like it could be much higher if it if it if it tried a little harder. I think. But what do you what do you think on these? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was actually shocked to see. Well, you know what? The, a, a big thing of that too. It could be a testament to the to their other vehicles in their portfolio and the volumes that those vehicles are pulling. Um, but. Like you and said, Hyundai, Kia, and the people who buy those just aren't aren't looking to go electric. Correct. So much of this is it is an education issue because, like I said, when somebody buys a car, if they have a garage and they have more than one car and they replace one of those cars and it's not an EV, my first thought is they did not make an informed decision. They they were. Uh, reasoning by analogy thinking well this is what i've done before this is what i'll do again instead of saying what is actually the best product because if you look at the ionic 5 and you look at the the um kia you know the hyundai ionic 5 and the kia ev6 it's like the best products they make <laughs> they're like the quickest quietest we're safest you know easiest to maintain cheapest to maintain most efficient when you look at the numbers you're like wow that's the best product this company makes I should probably, if I'm going to shop Kia and Hyundai, I should probably buy that product because it's the best thing they make. And you're not seeing the buyer do that, even with the with the incentives in place. So it's, it's this huge educational thing. And people may say, oh, you know, it's the premium price and things like that. But with the incentives in place and when you cross shop of what cross those SUVs are costing, things like that, and cost of ownership over time, the people aren't considering these things. Yeah, I thought when you said it's a testament to, and pause. I thought you were going to say how 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 well Tesla is reaching people and and selling its its uh, competitors. You know, the Model Three, the Model Y, in particular, like because it is sort of like that's also part of the story. Obviously, is that Tesla has reached people and connected with people, and it sells so many of its two main models that it's hard for anyone else to break through. And I, you know, I own a Model 3, you own a Model 3. I don't know in your case, but the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Kia EV6 are like the top two non-Tesla EVs that I've I've, I've wanted, mm -hmm. I've thought about buying. Um, uh, there's also sure. the Mustang Mach-E, but I, I prefer those two actually. So they're really mm -hmm. compelling. Like they're in the category of, I can compete with Tesla's vehicles, which is why I find it, you know, a little bit dispiriting that they don't have anywhere close to the volumes that Tesla has. <laughs> well, and, that, and that brings up that brings up another thing that really struck. And this is a, a chart that comes up later. I don't, not to get ahead of ourselves. Sure. But if I read it correctly, the like that like for example, the EV6 um, was it in 
between 2022 and 2023, I'm referring to my notes here. It's all, if, if I'm reading that, if I made my notes correctly, it's 1,100 vehicles, EV6, mm-hmm. yeah, compared, to right. four, compared to 400,000. <laughs> yeah, worldwide. exactly. So it's, was... so it's a quarter of a percent. <laughs> exactly. It's a quarter of a percent. So even when people say the competition is coming and it is absolutely competition, the, the, the Kia EV6 is a compelling midsize hatchback and it's great. And even then, it's a quarter of a percent. A quarter of a percent. David. 1,100 compared to 400,000. I'm not going to lie. There's many times when I've looked at these numbers and I thought, wait, is that right? And I've had to double check because I'm like, is it really that much? Are they really selling that many more? I've I've double checked these numbers doing these quarterly reports probably a dozen times because I'm just like, is it really that big of a difference? Because it's... It's, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I'll just close on this I with... I couldn't believe that. Yeah, we get more yeah. of that in a, yeah, in a we, second. Yeah, we, Holy we, moly. We have That's that. another thing that blew my mind. One thing I wanted to highlight here on the fourth quarter, Ford jumped a bit. So compared to um, 2023 overall, which of course includes the fourth quarter, Ford had 3.8% of its uh, of its sales BEVs. And in the fourth quarter, it was 5.6. So Ford had a strong fourth quarter. Uh, we don't... Don't know what that's going to mean for 2024, but hopefully it means good things. Uh, but it definitely had a had a push with the the F-150 Lightning and some others. If you look at share of the auto market, uh, share of the EV, BEV auto market, I mean, this is one of those charts that just shows how ridiculous Tesla is ahead. Like you don't recognize that top bar as even part of the chart. It looks like the border of the chart because it's like, it's not anywhere close to the Ford or the Chevy chart, which are second and third. And Rivian, there. Look at Rivian. Yeah, climbing up. Little, little, the little train that. What's it called? The the little train that could. The little train that could. Yeah. This is another thing that really, really, really shocked me. And and again, again, with Tesla being so far ahead, it, it you don't notice if you should celebrate or be sad to be like. It celebrates exactly. you know, that's t- always Tesla. That's always the dilemma. Writing, I'll let you get back to it, but it's all that's always my struggle writing about it. Do I celebrate Tesla's leadership? Do I, do I, you know, talk about how disappointing it is that there's not more competition? It's very hard to say because Tesla is, I don't know, it's, it's difficult. Sorry, I'll let you continue. I just, I, you nailed yeah. my dilemma writing so many times. I'm like, how do I write about this? I mean, as a as a investor and all this stuff that you want to see this kind of total market domination, you're like, yeah, like, holy macro, you know, scoreboard, we're number one, hoorah, all that good stuff. But then at the same time, being an advocate for, you know, a better future for our children and, and cars, you know, not pumping, uh, yeah, you know, into, um, uh, you know, a cleaner environment, and everything like, Wow, maybe you know. I wish the other there was an adoption over these other brands. Another thing that really surprised me from this chart, and this is very uh, a, I was pleasantly surprised, is Rivian topping out Hyundai, Mercedes, Volkswagen, and Audi, Kia. Like Rivian topped out again. You have these you have these players in the market. You you have the 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 Hyundai. Ion, Ionic five and Ionic six. You have the, you know, the Kia EV six. Really compelling products from these established brands that have marketing power, advertising power, um, dealership distribution, service distribution. All of these huge adva- global networks. All of these huge advantages, and yet the the new guy. Is, is beating them out. And you could say, well, there's this been this pent up demand for Rivians because people had pre-orders and they're waiting for them to, to deliver. But even still, amazing to see, you know? Yeah, no, I, it's similar. It's similar to the Tesla situation. Like you celebrate Rivian for rising up so quickly and, and you know, creating products that people love so much that they're jumping into a new brand with a small track record again or do you like 
commiserate that you know the competition that the the big automakers are not pushing their evs well enough and it's it's even hard to say because i mean almost all the car commercials i see these days are for electric vehicles so not just like youtube ads and stuff but like on like stuff that's not yeah, broadcast television yeah yeah and i'm like yeah because on youtube you could say oh well their yeah. youtube's algorithm is data mining my interests and telling you know seeing that i'm interested in electric vehicles so they're tailoring the the banner ads and the videos to my interests. but when i'm watching jeopardy or watching a football game or whatever on television and these ads coming up, they're not smart ads. These are general, you know, they're not yeah. tracking my data and things. So, um, and we'll see it with the so Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is coming up. I bet your money there's going to be far more EV ads than non EV ads from legacy automakers. I mean, it's, there always are, it seems like. So, I, I, I think they're trying in some sense. But there are hitches in like the dealer process and and production su supply. Like I think this is part of it. Like if you put a ton of EVs on a lot, people are more likely to buy EVs. And you know, if you have a few in the corner, and people are going to get into the dealer and be like, "Oh yeah, I, I want something in front of my eyes here." <laughs> you know. So anyway, well, and, with the, the, and the dealer and the dealer situation is this whole other. Yeah, that's a whole other piece. Wow. But yeah. and if you look at the fourth quarter, Rivian looks even better. Also, again, Ford climbed up a lot. So Ford went uh, Tesla dropped from fifty nine percent to fifty six percent. So I'm I'm very curious of the quarter that Tesla will drop below fifty percent because it's dominated the market for years, but it actually has slowly gone down in ter terms of share of the BEV market as other automakers have actually produced EVs and, and sold them, and you know. I make better and better ones, but I'm curious when that crossover will be. But you see, Ford went went up from 6.5 percent on the year as a whole, which, to repeat, includes the fourth quarter. So it's you know it's biased upward. If if you were just compare the fourth quarter to the previous three quarters, it would look uh, more of a difference. Uh, so it went from 6.5 percent to 8.5 percent, and um, and Rivian went from from uh, from fifth, uh, sorry fourth to third climbed above chevy uh chevy's struggling not exactly leading over there in the gm land but uh we'll move on <laughs> oh this is the volume yeah so this is volume sales so that was percentage this is this you know same thing but in volume not percentage and yeah you just see tesla sold like six hundred sixty-two thousand vehicles in 2023 in the u.s and um this is, I should say, this is not official numbers. These are based heavily on Troy Tesla's estimates, estimates because he's so good at this. Uh, but also some mm -hmm. Clean Technica um, uh, decisions and and you know looking at Tesla's figures and charts and different things. Uh, just to, you know, and also you know we have all these different reports from around the world to to balance it off of. But yeah, so it's about six hundred sixty two thousand versus Ford selling about seventy three thousand. It's still I still get a little bit of inspiration. Okay, Ford sold seventy three thousand EVs last year. Okay, we're making progress. Chevy sold sixty three thousand. Rivian fifty thousand. That's you know, but then yeah, so overall it's not very uplifting. Hey look at that. Who's down there? <laughs> so, oh I should have yeah, so we, I should have opened these charts bigger. <laughs> Yes. Any final yeah, thoughts we as we scan, scan through these? I did open them bigger. I forgot to scroll. Yeah, yeah. The, um, as far as the fourth quarter sales are concerned, I know, for me, people in the know who are uh, an informed consumer in the electric vehicle market, it'll be interesting the effect of Tesla's Q4 sales numbers because, like me and many others like me, we are holding out for the Model 3 Highland. So you're holding out, holding out, holding out. It was it was released globally in um, in China and Europe months before it was released here. It's just now been released here in Q1 of this year. So I'm wondering how many buyers were just pent up in the quarters leading up to the end of 2023, waiting for the refresh Model 3, which has now since come in this quarter, and how now they're springing on board. For that, so it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it'll be but, interesting to see how that affects Model Three sales in Q1 and going into Q2, and then also they have not yet released the performance Model Three. So there's going to be this wave of people that are interested in the standard 
rear wheel drive and the all wheel drive, which is currently the offering that that that's available. The performance offering of the refresh is currently not available yet, but there is um, talk and hints that it is coming. We don't know exactly when. So like me, I want to get the, the performance one. So again, I'm like holding on. And then there'll be, it's kind of the spring that's being compressed and then it'll be released. So it'll be interesting to see how that's going to release in the, uh, with the, the refresh model three here in Q, Q1. Cause that's well, building up. I know so well, many people are like, I'm waiting for the refresh. I'm waiting for the refresh. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, first of all, I was just, was gonna, you know, isn't it sad that China gets the refresh version before the home market of us but it's it's but so it's, odd it's, it's so a, odd it's because the chinese ev market is hyper competitive hugely competitive uh yes, in the fourth right. quarter the white products. for the first time i mean it happened once barely before but basically for the first time significantly uh fourth in the fourth quarter tesla had more sales in china than in, in the u.s um so previously, the U.S. had always been its bigger market, but the Chinese EV market is enormous. It's it's more than half of the global EV market, and it's mm -hmm. hyper competitive with really compelling electric vehicle, smart electric vehicle models. So Tesla has to be more competitive there. So it's it does make sense, but it is also sad. I mean, like on a macro globe, you know, bigger picture look, it's like wow, we're really falling behind. We don't even get the first. The first, ver <laughs> the first new Tesla, like we don't even, get, yeah. we're not even priority. Well, again, for it's cult it's yeah, it's cultural bias too, right? I mean, because yeah. because we live in America, we're like, well, of course we should be first. We should but it's be also first. it's we're Tesla's America. home market, so you know. Yeah, exactly. In theory, it's American auto brand, you know, but, which we'll talk uh, about later, has the largest manufacturing facility in America. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, but but on the on that uh, topic of demand in the U.S., I, I was thinking the the, I mean. The, the base Model 3 and the long-range Model 3 lost the $7,500 the $7, tax credit uh, in 2024. The performance model still has it. So I I thought, you know, there's a concern for sales dropping, of, of sales dropping off for Tesla uh, in, in regards to the Model 3. Of course, more people are buying the Model Y anyway. But, um, but yeah, I, it's, I think it's actually good that the Highland is was delayed then because it sort of counterbalanced that you know it's, it's provided probably evened out any big changes in demand because you have the drop off from losing the tax credit but then you have the rise from the new highland hitting the market so uh oh yeah, yeah hopefully that will kind of even themselves out yeah and then uh so we're done with we'll, we'll move on to um so this yeah this is where we can sort of talk about tesla's ridiculous growth which actually ended up going in a direction i was surprised by the end of the article from when i started the beginning of the article but yeah this is an overall look at 2023 and 2022 sales of different models in the US, ev models in the u.s and the thing that that jumped yeah. out to me like not just how many model wise were sold but actually the increase from one year to the next like this is what i ended up you Insane. know sorry this doesn't work um it's like the increase from 2022 to 2023 is so big it dwarfs any other vehicle sales just the increase <laughs> like even the model 3 looks like a uh height challenged <laughs> uh yeah the model like, 3 is this negligible you it's, know it's like whoa. bump and then you have this kind of meteoric next level progression in, in model y and it's so the juxtaposition again like it, it's not linear it's you know where's where second where you go second third fourth fifth you think those would be it'd be more of a horse race yes. and it's, <laughs> that it's so it's and again i think it, it just speaks volumes to the ev market in general in the united states and and kind of the the status of where we're at where if it's not a tesla People, you know, and this goes into a broader psychology of um, of um, range anxiety and uh, you know charging infrastructure and in and customer education things like that. Where Tesla has that figured out, and it's very like here it is, and it's just right. figured out. Where other people, it's whether OEMs, it's not yet um, fully baked. 
Uh, I think get, we see that here. Yeah, stay, stay a little closer to the mic. We lose you into like a warbly, watery land when you sit back, it looks like. Oh, okay. <laughs> but oh, yeah, is, it no, I, is it my headphones? Is that, uh... I think just when you are away from the... Oh, okay. When you sit back okay. more, maybe. Uh, oh, okay. But yeah, I mean, even like... It's it even drops off a lot more after like the you know eleventh or twelfth, but down there like uh, in the top ten, so you have the Model X, and we we know on the Tesla charts, and when we talk about Tesla, like the Model X is negligent. I mean, nobody really cares about the S and X anymore because they're such lower volume, and still they're like in there in the mix with the other <laughs> with the EV other top EV models, like in terms of sales. So it's like it just it's a whole different league, you know, and um. And on the one hand, it's not just that they are, it's not just like that they are not succeeding as much as we would hope. It's also a case of just how popular the Model Y is. I mean, it became the top selling vehicle in the world last year. It's just, just astounding. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a value for money package. It's like a, it's a generational, you know, model that, trans that i mean the, the model 3 was the transformative one but the model y is the improved you know the crossover version so it's it just stands out as such a unique leader that it doesn't matter what the others do they're not going to it's going to be so far ahead right yeah that's the thing i mean i think it's the model y is what happens when you take a car as compelling as the model three and you you give it the functionality of a crossover which is which is obviously exactly what it is it's it, you add a hatchback i mean the the amount of functionality that comes with having a hatchback as far as cargo capability is enormous uh, it opens wow. it up into a whole new category of functionality and so you're just doing that your sound just got a lot better so i'm not sure what changed but so <laughs> i don't know so maybe it's something. Yeah, like that. I don't know because I think it. Yeah, maybe I have to keep just keep leaning forward. Yeah. yeah, but so the thing that's that shocked me actually was you know first was that this how much the Model Y increase in sales, how much that was like bigger than any other model sales alone. Uh, but then when I got down to the bottom of the article, I realized you know, but non-Tesla EV sales had increased more than Tesla sales in 2023. So actually, when you add up that long tail of different of new EV models, growing EV models, it's sort of like the cases of Mercedes that we talked about. They add up to more than we probably recognize when we look at those charts. So, so actually, Tesla EV sales grew strongly by one hundred fifty thousand um, year over year, but non Tesla EV sales grew by more than two hundred thousand. So. That's, you know, even the Model Y, Model 3 combined didn't grow by as much as the rest of the EV market. So while those charts make all the other models look, you know, embarrassingly weak, altogether, there we have a really nicely growing, you know, smorgasbord of options, a uh, variety of options, and good EVs that are competing in different niches, right? Correct. And, and and there's, again, two ways to look at it. One is that the numbers of other EVs were so pathetically low to begin with <laughs> that they only had they only had up to go. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the cynical take. But like you said, the positive take is how wonderful that they're actually starting to build and sell these things. Still a long, 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 long way to go. But at least we're start we're starting to see from these little teeny beginnings the sprouting of these numbers to go up, and it's starting to affect bottom line, of course, um, as they and, can improve their 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 product margin. Uh, it'll be even more incentive for them to do that. And they'll come with volume. Yeah, and and I don't really bother going back much further because twenty twenty there was very little on the market outside of Tesla, but twenty twenty one to 2022 they both grew by about 150,000 tesla and non-tesla evs uh so you just see that there's an acceleration in 2023 and we'll see what 2024 brings uh yeah this is what one thing you referenced earlier which is um i i guess this happened a while back but i it, it, it exited my memory bank apparently 
And, um, and I saw someone mention this and I was like, wow, this is not getting the attention it deserves. Uh, you know, Tesla Fremont factory, Tesla's California factory is now the largest auto production factory in the United States. I mean, that's, that's astounding. I mean, you, you look at, you know, Detroit, the big three, and then you've got now all these Southern factories from traditional automakers in Tennessee and you know South Carolina, different places. But Tesla stands out as having the biggest auto production factory in the country, and it's right there in Silicon Valley, California. Where, where else would it be, right? <laughs> well, yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah. That's that that alone is so funny. And like you said, this this really flew under the radar. And I think it's kind of like you know there are certain celebrities and certain politicians that they're so crazy all the time. Yeah. That when they do something, they do so much. They say so many crazy things. They do say crazy things that one more crazy thing just kind of goes under the radar. And it's and but for Tesla, it's they do so many amazing things and they have so many amazing milestones yeah. that a milestone like this, which is an incredible thing, it should be celebrated. It's it's a it's a such a te- it's it's the ultimate American success story. It's it's bringing American manufacturing back. All the good things that should, would make a great headline in major news orbits kind of goes under the radar because they just do amazing things all the time that go underappreciated. Yeah. Well, this is one of them. This is absolutely incredible news. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one is exactly what you said. Another thing is. The face of Tesla says so many crazy things every day that that it's like there's so much news to cover on Elon Musk. I mean, there's just like right now there's the the shareholder uh, lawsuit and and all that. I mean, it's not even a like a normal uh, Elon Musk you know story week like uh, where it's about whatever he tweeted you know whatever. But it's there's just so much there, and there's so many outlets that cover Elon Musk and Tesla now. But they have all these things to choose from and i don't think i've seen anyone choose this story and even like the case of of the model y becoming a top selling vehicle in the world again i think that's undercovered under under noticed it's enormous but but that's getting way more i mean that's been highlighted much more than this but this is like this is more significant perhaps to the u.s than even that so it's like yeah, it, it, yeah. Just going on the topic of, of headlines, there's actually something that happened uh, today, which I'm sure you know about. Uh, it's it all the headlines. I actually I, I tweeted about it and sent it on social media because it just, just gets so flabbergasted by by things like this. So you have news like this: Tesla's California factory is now the largest auto production factory in the United States. Amazing news. You have another headline, Tesla Model Y, the greatest selling car in the world, the highest selling car in the world in 2023. Amazing news. Both of these things, no one knows about. Let me tell you, when I was brushing my teeth this morning on my phone, what two, the headlines popped up on every news media outlet. Two million Teslas recalled for safety flaw. <laughs> and then it's... and. And I had to tell, and I'm getting texts from people. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? And I have to explain them. Oh, yes. Let me tell you what's actually happening. They're changing the font size by 5% on the screen. It's, a, it's, an over the, it's an over-the-air software update that will inconvenience no one. It'll do it while the owner of this car is sleeping. They probably won't even know it happened. And everything will be fine. But the way the headline reads, it's like it's every car has to go to a service. So like these are the headlines that people are seeing that are the, the least consequential. Yeah. They're, and not they're non-issue nonsense. And then so it, it really blows the mind what headlines are getting out there because Tesla's doing all these other things. It's like, well, did you actually see this? This is actually an incredible historical event that is actually pretty amazing. They're like, oh no, I heard about the two million car recall though. Yeah. Which is no. the recall <laughs> thing drives me nuts because I mean to the point that I just started blocking this stuff out because <laughs> we covered it for years about how 
a different term should be used when it's just a software update. Like, because everyone thinks recall, oh, if I had a Tesla, I'd have to bring it into the service center and wait for it to be fixed. And oh, it has a big safety issue. And we know the vast majority of people see headlines and don't dig deeper. It's, so it's like, correct. You just well, see, oh, wow, time after time, Tesla's got a big, huge recall. And all it is is a simple software update that nobody notices to their car. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's really annoying. I, I really wish they had come up with a new term by now for over the air, you know, changes, uh, because it's so misleading. And it, it definitely, I mean, it adds up and people have in their image, a very warped sense of what the Tesla brand is and what Tesla vehicles are and Tesla vehicle, what Tesla vehicle ownership is, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's the term out like the Wall Street Journal. I'm going to call them out. I can't, I won't say it verbatim, but I'll, I know one word that they used in their headline it was, it was um, Tesla rec 2 million cars recalled for a safety flaw. They used the word flaw. And, and, and it's, it's, they're literally changing the size of the font. So it'd be like iPhone or Android saying, you know, in the latest recall, oh, you know the notifications you get on your phone? We changed the font by 5%, which would, people would, wouldn't even acknowledge that. It you could even call it a safety flaw because it's, uh, it was harder to dial 911 in case of emergency with a smaller, you know? <laughs> well, well, correct. Well, correct. I mean, well, that's what, I mean, that's what, could, the, head, that's yeah. what the news media is going with. They're yeah. taking that and, and running with this yeah. non with this non issue, so then you have something here with the with the factory, um, yeah. and and you know I had to go on that little tangent because it was just that popped no, up. No, I think that's really it's useful. I just so flabbergasted. It, that you it know. irritates me so much now that it's like I can't I can't do it because also I don't see it improving or changing. Like we can write about it every time, and we pretty much well, I, think, I think we do it every time we're like. This is misleading, or we we have a different headline that does you know tries to illuminate right from the start, you know. But it's just like it's a it's a it's a hopeless effort because I mean it just keeps happening and it's not. What? Yeah, correct. And I'll, I'll I'll post about it on LinkedIn or something, and I'll get all these comments. The media, whoever posted this headline, should should. Uh, publish an ap apology and, and i was like yeah but they don't they yeah. won't they're not they, going they, to they're like yeah you can say shame on you this is the death of journalism and all these things and they're just kind of like yeah we know <laughs> yeah. and it's and like what's crazy I mean, is what are they supposed i mean they have to go out of their way to to use a different less clickable word so i mean as long as it's called a recall they're gonna write recall and and you know, get more people's attention, and it's like I don't, I don't know. It's and it's, flawed. It's they, they, they're like largest yeah, safety recall flaw. ever, flaw, yeah. flaw. And then it's like, so they're they're basically forfeiting in overall integrity because the fact of the matter is, I can speak for myself. I don't. Every time I get a headline from these particular organizations, now there's a question mark after it. So I'm yeah. like, gosh, if they're not telling the full truth about that. What oh, else are they sensationalizing? So their yeah. their integrity as an organization goes out the window for because if you're in the know and you hear something, if you're an industry expert and you hear someone report on your industry and it's not factual, then you you go, well, I know that that's factually not true. Mm -hmm. So that then you question the integrity of of the um, of that source. So now I don't click on them now. So they're kind of forfeiting. Yeah long-term integrity for the short-term click revenue which is totally. a, which is you know very short totally. but anyway no, uh, it's, and it's a good uh, reminder uh, too if you like what you're watching and reading subscribe like us uh if you like our independent clean tech journalism please donate directly to clean technica so that we can continue being a counter puncher to those big media outlets that are well placed Sort of trailing well, off. So I appreciate the, you reminded me to do the pitch, which I always forget and I hate doing, but you know, well, if, please, really, if you do like, you know, and especially, you know, David, uh, smash be, that like button. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the as, like button, the subscribe, the bell, you know, do all the things and whatever. All the things. Uh, I'm, I'm a very good at pitching this, but, uh, and, and really, you know, support us. It goes, it, it makes a big difference to get a few dollars a month from thousands of people. And, um, 
help us do what we do with the independence and you know in you know growing independence which helps us rely less and less on advertising which eventually we, we would love to not ha even have advertising but um right now we still need it to do our jobs and run the machine that is clean technica um so alongside i do the quarterly you know ev sales reports for the u.s and those um those percentages of e of automaker shares come also from my doing quarterly reports on the auto industry as a whole in the U.S., where I ch I get the official numbers from all the automakers, almost all. There's a few that don't publish. It's you know weird, um, detailed uh, numbers, but for the most part, this is you know the entire almost the entire U.S. auto industry, and I and I've been doing something that I don't think anyone else does, which you know you can see a lot of year over year reports that show how the auto industry and different automakers are are changing but i've dug back you know I, I do going back to 2019 so it's now five year coverage of um how sales have changed in the u.s auto industry uh of course in thrown into the wrench there was the the covid pandemic but 2019 was like a normal year so i find it most interesting often to compare the current year to 2019 and see how things are different mm -hmm. and you know you can look through the changes through the pandemic and, and everything but um compared to 2019 i mean you can say that see that there's been a recovery for the past few years since 2020 uh you know we've been slowly recovering out of the pandemic but if you compare to 2019 u.s auto sales are still nine percent lower than they were uh 1.5 million units lower than they were in 2019 and uh wow. You have, uh, yeah, have these different charts uh, showing that, and I think more interesting is to get to the um, to the changes in brand. But uh, this is just the flat numbers, the leadership uh, in the U.S. auto industry, and I mean, I think it's amazing. We have Tesla now at number eight, so it's right there at number eight in the top ten, and with a little bit of a climb it could be up to number five. So it could, it could climb above Kia and Hyundai um, and, and Nissan. If it is, come on, Cybertruck, <laughs> give it the boost yeah. and Highland. Which, uh, yeah. Uh, but, and then you get up to the, the big four, basically Toyota, Ford, Chevrolet, and Honda, which have dominated auto sales in the country for a long time. And uh, in particular, Honda used to be like up there more in that big four, and they've they've dropped off a lot. So they've they've been losing sales. But and then I'll just highlight that we have the other uh, EV brands here. Rivian is way down there, and Lucid is nearly at the bottom. Poor Fiat is on the verge of death in the U.S. As we've discussed before, I did see your that wife driving. Crazy. I saw your wife oh, before God. you told me about the flu or the hitting your house. I or right after the day after, I saw uh, at an intersection. I saw her driving Eleanor to um, to school in the little blue, beautiful blue Fiat Five Hundred. I love that vehicle so so much. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> it gets like, more attention than my Tesla because it's more novel. Yeah, you know? exactly. The, ele the electric powder blue Fiat Five Hundred driving around, which is my yeah. wife. And then you've got Bright Drop at the bottom there, GM's uh, EV delivery vehicle brand. Um, so any comments on this before we move on to the changes in the... Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, a couple of things uh, jumped out. One, again, yeah, yeah crazy that, that a, a delivery van company that just came on the scene is about to trump Fiat's in three-digit sales. And have you seen years. the Bright Drops? I see them in... I saw one in my neighborhood, yes. Like, we're on my I, street oh, yesterday. I, I have not seen one yet. Oh I've, my I've, gosh! I've seen the Rivian. I've seen the Rivian delivery vans everywhere, which I'm very excited about. But I haven't seen the the, um, the bright drop yet. Oh, maybe it's just a matter of time. But um, this chart, what really amazed me was Tesla's position. What's it at number eight now? Is that what it is? That where it is now? Um, a Tesla's position on sales for two thousand. Is that what we said? Okay, yeah. so what, what's crazy was, you know, there's this there's this narrative that, you know, and I'll, I'll often say it's amazing Tesla's growth, continued growth, this kind of astronomical growth. And then the, the counter argument is people say, yeah, but they're this small little startup, so all they have to go is up. Well, if you look at this chart, you're like, not anymore. They're bigger than Jeep. 
GMC, Ram, Mazda, BMW, Mercedes, Lexus, Dodge, Cadillac, <laughs> these are major players. And Tesla's selling more than them. So they're not this small niche they're about, about more than twice the volume is. About twice yeah. the volume of Volkswagen. Correct. It's like, would you call Dodge a niche seller in the United States? General Motors or GMC, would you call that? Would you call them a, a, a niche se seller? Mazda, would you call that a, a, you know, a, a, niche, a niche of niche small player? No. Y you know, um, so when you say like, so Tesla is not the small player anymore that, you know, oh, sure, it's easy for them to grow. They're a huge player that is still growing. So that how crazy is that? That they're bigger than these companies now from, from, a, from a sales perspective perspective no, that's like, like brass tax sales numbers crazy that's... like crazy like no, my, my like, dad that's a okay. great point i mean they're four times the size of volvo sales chrysler sales cadillac sales four times uh approximately four times uh i can't do the math precisely in my head but around four times the size of buick sales uh, and more than three times the size of Dodge, Dodge sales. Like that's, yeah, that's a great point. It's, it's crazy. Like my my dad was a an, an engineer for Chrysler and Dodge for thirty eight years. He uh, he was an executive for the last several years there. And the tech center, the um the Chrysler tech center was in Auburn Hills, um, which is right next to where I grew up in Rochester Hills, Michigan. And the tech center is the size of a city. It's this like sprawling building. It's like it's like the Pentagon almost. It's this massive building, and it's like this this behemoth. So you get this idea of this like huge industrial global giant, and you're like, wow, this is this massive player in the global uh, industrial world. And then to think that they're now a fraction <laughs> the size of that, or Tesla is, um, uh, um, you know, multiples bigger than that is is crazy. And my and my, you know, we'd always reference when Tesla was just starting. My dad would say, "Oh, you know, Tesla's just this puny little oh. automaker that the that the big boys are going to stomp out, squash." Like a, a bug, <laughs> and historically, he would be correct because oh, yeah. if you reason, if you reason by analogy, over the decades there have been countless domestic startup automobile startups that have failed. So the odds were against Tesla to even survive, yet thrive. And not only have they survived, not only have they thrived, they're, they're, they have now trumped. A big three automaker, or what was once a, a big three automaker, that was considered this huge glo global juggernaut. So they're not the, the new little fragile flower anymore. They're like bigger than Jeep, GMC cars, or Dodge. I mean, we're crazy to Ram. acknowledge that. Ram. Ram, Ram mean, is the, one let's go Ca Cadillac, Buick, Volvo, Mitsubishi, Lincoln. I mean, good God, Porsche, Infinity, Porsche, Infinity, Rivian. I mean, these, oh, Rivian's a new new one. But you have these est established brands that people yeah. said they'll never get to those numbers. Yeah. And now they dwarf those numbers. Actually, you could, you could add up Buick, Cadillac, Chrysler, and uh, Lincoln together, and they wouldn't have as many sales as Tesla. So it's, it is, it is, it's also fascinating. Like, I mean, I find it a really interesting question. Does Tesla drop at some point like how many model y's and model threes can it sell each year in the u.s does it continue to rise because it's still seen as a niche company that people haven't considered much until now like i it's always fascinating to me the new buyers like like when did they hear about it when did they start getting interested what sold them on uh not just tesla but also the other non-tesla evs i'm always curious like because you know the early adopter, we knew the very early adopter community. I mean, we were we were part of that. And uh, mm. actually, on the the S curve, technically, it's like the innovators is the is that 
that phase of buyers that we often call early adopters. Um, so we knew we, we, it's easy to describe that community. It's, it's very like, it's, it's, I'm very curious who current new buyers are, like how they got to this. Of course, it's so easy to be electric to, you know, plug in at home, but it's such a mental hurdle for people to think about it to, they all, there's the top two questions always, how long does it take to charge? And, and, uh, and uh, how far can it drive? And, you know, we know those questions are not like, <laughs> there's no there's no serious concern there unless you don't have home charging. But uh, it's such a mental hurdle. So it's always like, well, and I, and I know someone who just bought a new car like a day or two ago, got a Honda hybrid. And it's like, it still doesn't break through that you could, you could get a, a better car that's more convenient. I mean, in his case, he drives a ton. So it's a little bit of a, of a jump, but still, it's just like he it wasn't even on the radar. I know someone else recently got a Cadillac uh, XT5, I think it is. Um, and again, like XDS. The the crossover? XDS. Okay. Is it a five or an S? Oh, yeah, but anyways, it's, you know, it's like wasn't even an option even though they're very like some members of the household are very tesla aware and focused but um it was not like an option on the table to like i don't think to even consider a not an electric so it's like so i know people are still like it's not on their option it's not a considered they think of teslas as super expensive they think of evs as not not practical but then there are so many people who are switching so like how What's the difference? How are those people being reached versus the others? You know, and what's what's making the difference either internally or externally in their in their lives? But but yeah, we we can uh, <laughs> getting into some interesting topics. So if you look year over year change uh, by brand um, percentage wise, you got Rivian and Bright Drop up at the top because and Lucid the top three are electric brands. But this is all because they're starting from like almost nothing. So so percentage yeah. growth is really uh-huh. easy for them. Tesla's there at thirty percent, which is solid growth. It's not, you know, the fifty percent they're striving for, uh, and it's not um, crazy numbers like you see when with much lower starting volumes. But it's it's solid. Um, as we said, that the market's bouncing back. There's only a few brands that are not doing well. Poor Fiat down there dropping thirty four percent from almost nothing to almost even more, even closer to nothing. I don't think they last much longer in this market. I don't know. Alfa Romeo dropped fifteen percent. I mean, for, forget the Alfa Romeo is even uh, present here, um, which is which is crazy because just a couple of years ago they had the Alfa Romeo Giulia was Motor Trend Car of the Year. Oh, that's which, true. <laughs> which you think like, man, yeah, which is like winning the Oscar, and it's like, I love Alfa Romeo, but it shows again <laughs> how hard it is to grow from a small size, and how mm-hmm. unbelievable, practically inconceivable. <laughs> To use a but even with the brand support, you have this like multinational conglomerate, conglomerate Stellantis, which kind of has under the umbrella uh, Fiat, Alfa Romeo, now Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep. Even with that global support of this massive global conglomerate, they're still as a brand dying at the vine well, which it's, is it's actually a, in, it's, interesting that you bring that up though because actually if you look at the brands that have dropped they're all they're all Stellantis except for lincoln you got jeep ram alfa romeo and fiat so Stellantis, uh, well lincoln's a four yeah lincoln's a ford, ford yeah uh, product. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, except, except for lincoln oh, but, oh yeah oh, i see oh yeah on yeah. that chart yes yeah so you have so, four yeah, these are all Stellantis brands. brands correct like that's uh yeah, Stellantis is struggling, but I mean, even as everyone else bounces back, uh, which is yeah. crazy because they still they still have glo- um, th- again being culturally biased. This we're looking at U.S. numbers. Stellantis is incredibly still a huge player globally. So, yeah. but they need, yeah. but obviously, as we know, the U.S. auto market is a huge market for overall global auto share. So, yeah, but I mean, they you need see, to. Um, but even Ram, a pickup, you know. Brand, I mean, they're they're doing like so something that, that should be the, that should be their bread and butter. Something's rotten in uh, Stellantis land, but uh, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's but it, when you think about it, just it's you know to use a reference of Princess Bride, it's inconceivable that Tesla 
has grown from such a tiny size as like Fiat and Alfa Romeo to um to what it has in a little over a decade. It's just crazy. Um, yeah, that's not going to be visible. Uh, so yeah, this is the fourth quarter. So this is changes in the fourth quarter. We'll skip that. We'll get to our last um, yes, the last last story of the of the day, which is a is a big discussion one big discussion topic like china is gonna get the tesla cyber truck it's um it's gonna be uh display it's gonna be shown you know shown around china very soon if it's not already being um and it just it piqued my interest seeing that news because i didn't originally ever think of the cyber truck as being a potentially a big seller in china and then once I saw this news, I was like, wait a second. I'm looking at this all wrong. Like, Cybertruck could be a huge hit in China because we think of China as buying a lot of cheap, small electric cars, which it does. But there's, it's a, as we said, it's big, it's more than half of the global EV market. And there's a lot more going on there than, sell, than sales of small, cheap EVs. So I don't know if you read this piece. I will get to my yeah. comments on it afterward, but, um, you can go you if you you can go ahead and jump in on uh, what you think about that first yeah i mean i think it's a, i think it's a very interesting development barring regulatory hurdles cuz that would be reading this article there's a couple of things that i was not aware of a lot of like really quirky things and you can yeah. get more into the specifics about like how I forgot about that <laughs> pick up how pickup trucks are only allowed to drive a certain speed and in a certain lane and how they're not a allowed in some urban environments like that would never fly in the united states like never that'd be like so un-american but in china apparently that's a thing and it's for pickup trucks only so it's this classification that maybe they could play around the semantic and say well it's not a pickup truck you know all these things so assuming they can address regulatory hurdles like um i don't know what the um pedestrian safety things are in China, which I know is a hindrance for the possibility of Cybertruck in European countries because it's built like a tank and um, uh, Europeans don't want a car to be built like a tank. Americans care far less about that. They say, yes, please build it like a tank. We love tanks. So, um, so for me, like you said, China being the largest auto market in the world and having a huge, huge huge luxury vehicle market one that other regions of the world cannot even fathom just by sheer volume uh you know i believe tesla's guidance was they said overall they're saying about 250,000 cyber trucks that's what they want to get to annual growth so if you take that if you build all the cyber trucks in austin and satisfy domestic demand and then augment domestic demand with Chinese demand. I'm going to use an, an Elon term. I think demand can be quasi infinite because you already have this product that had over a million pre-orders. Some would say two, two million pre-orders. So even if a fraction of those people don't end up ordering their, their cyber truck, um, just from pre-orders, you already have a backlog of years of every cyber truck they build is sold. So, and then you have the, the phenomenon that has happened with all other Teslas, that once you experience a Tesla, you want a Tesla. So even people who have never heard of cyber truck, never put a pre-order on a cyber truck, never want an electric car, when their neighbor has it or their coworker has it, they're gonna go, holy moly, I want one too. I'm not quite sure why, but I know I want it. It's, it's not even a, it doesn't even have to be a logical choice. It's just an emotional choice. And let's be honest, that's a lot what Cybertruck is. It's this thing where you're like, I shouldn't want it. I don't need it. Um, it's kind of ridiculous in a lot of ways, but still take my money. I just have to have this thing. And it, it's, it's this very, I think it's just because it's so shockingly different. So in that way, it's very exciting to be in the Chinese market. I'm going to use the term quasi-infinite. There's going to be people that are going to want it. Well, yeah, a lot of people. There's two things that really made me think that I was 
you know, probably that I was not giving this enough thought previously, like how big it could be in China. One is, uh, you know, wealthy Chinese buyers love big vehicles, actually. Like, Li Auto is the most successful new energy vehicle startup now in the country. Its three models are all giant full-size land yachts, these huge SUVs, and they're all in the top 20 of Chinese EV model sales, which is dominated by BYD. Uh, and Tesla's got a Model Y and Model 3 in there. But for Li Auto to have three giant, dis- different giant <laughs> models there. High, high just, end, high price. High end, high price. It just shows like there's a lot of Chinese buyers who want that type of vehicle. And... And you're missing the story if you think China's just about small, cheap EVs. Uh, Correct, and, and, not there's, at all. and there's not you're not you're not selling the Cybertruck to to um, you know yeah, cowboys and construction right. workers in China. No, this is, this, well, so a lux- this is a luxury product. Well, yeah. that's the the yeah. other thing is you know my experience with uh, Chinese people, uh, both the Chinese market in China and you know Chinese foreigners who live abroad they're very attracted to new glossy tech like they're very tech focus tech obsessed yeah. you might say they they're, they're, yeah and the country as a whole is much quicker adopting new tech uh, implementing new tech uh but i mean that's one reason why they jumped on tesla so quickly and why tesla quickly set up a gigafactory there and why tesla sells more vehicles there than anywhere else in the world because they love shiny new tech and seeing the Cybertruck in person, I mean, I've seen, you know, you can, you don't have to see it in person to get the, the idea that this is shiny new tech that could become very trendy. But seeing it in person is exactly what you said. It's like, you're looking at it, you're like, this is not anywhere close to my vehicle category, what I look for in a vehicle, but I want it. It's like, it's got that draw, that shiny new tech draw, and just the, the design that... It's got some pull to it that I think is going to actually be a big hit in China. I think this is going to be something that a lot of Chinese people will be interested in. And I think it could, it could out, I mean, it could potentially outsell the US market. I mean, I, it's still unclear what's going to happen in the US market with it. And I, I think what you brought up with regulations about pickup trucks is really important. I didn't know about that before doing this story, but, um, I don't see how they can't reclassify it as, as as an SUV. Like, especially with the Tonneau cover, like, just reclass. Like, they've got to find a way. I mean, of course, it can be difficult politically to do anything, but if they find a way to reclassify it, like, it's going head to head with those Lee Auto vehicles, and it's going to be ready to fight. <laughs> like, well, and just like do like a make it a hatch, make it a huge kind of like can't like maybe a, like an accordion hat i don't know you mean like Something do a chinese version like, like slightly modify it is that what you mean yeah exactly like make like yeah perfect example when model s first was introduced to the chinese market back when i was working at, at tesla a very thing a very interesting thing happened for test drives the we would say oh are you ready to test drive the car yes when we walk when they approach the vehicle the Chinese customer walked to the back seat, not the driver's seat, because because affluent Chinese, a lot of them do not drive their cars; they are driven in their cars. So culturally, we're like, oh, okay. And if you recall, the back seat of the Model S, the original Model S, let's just say the original Model S was a driver-centric car, <laughs> yeah. you know. But yeah. even even after. Um, even after Recaro started, particularly after Recaro started making the front seats, the the original front seats, let's be frank, were garbage. I call them lawn chairs. And um, but when Recaro came into the picture as a supplier for Tesla and started making the front seats, chef's kiss, they were wonderful. And then of course Tesla went in house with the seat manufacturing and still have amazing seats. But the back seats were like a park bench. And so what they found out was, gosh, the Chinese customer is going to the back seat. We have to make a Chinese centric back seat. So they actually made a um, 
uh, I forgot what the option was, but it was basically two bucket seats in the back. And they offered that for a very limited time in the United States as well. It didn't sell because Americans just don't care that much as, as the Chinese market. But they did make this market adjustment based on a cultural preference. And I think they can do the same here. It's just like, like, oh, it's a you think it's a pickup truck? No, it's actually an SUV with a huge hatch. Yeah, you know, uh, because I, it's not it's not shaped like a couch like other pickup trucks. You know, because um, if it's a, if you see a pickup truck anywhere else, it's very undeniable. It's shaped like a shape a chaise lounge. It's obviously a pickup truck. Here, there's a semantic debate. Yeah. We could say no, it's a hatch. It's a you know because you know it doesn't have that the the um yeah. chaise lounge couch no, shape. I, yeah, and I, I mean the the Chinese the tight Tesla crew in China is very savvy. I th- imagine they'll they'll be looking very cleverly at how to how to do that kind of thing. And yeah, so the back seat of the Cybertruck is is I mean the Model Y and Model Three still don't have you know great back seats. They're um, they're not the for sure the most spacious or or best. Um, the Cybertruck I understand has more has has some pretty good space there. I haven't been in it, so I can't. I can't really compare, but uh, but yeah, I, I I mean, just think of how many Model Ys have been sold there, and you think you know how many of those people might upgrade, you know, as they make more, as they have more money, as the Cybertruck becomes available, as it becomes a trendy model, how many might you know um, move on to a Cybertruck in time, or how many you know other buyers might come to Tesla. So it's it's a uh, I'm. It makes me a lot more bullish on the Cybertruck than I initially was. And the other thing is just, I don't know, being in his presence, it's got such a draw that I think I think it's not captured in pictures where he, it looks weird anywhere. But in pictures, it just looks sort of weird to a lot of people. In person, it stands out, but it's got more of a draw. And, and it's it looks, it has a little more of a, oh, wow, that's a, that's some kind of SUV, not some whole different type of vehicle. So I, I don't know. We'll see. It could have a Hummer, too much of a Hummer vibes and Hummer volumes in in some markets. But uh, and I don't see it ever being a big hit in Europe. But <laughs> but China, yeah. I think could 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 surprise and actually end up being the Cybertruck's biggest market. Maybe. Um, yeah, could be. Could be. Any final thoughts? I think that's that's the show. Uh, quite a good introduction for david and uh in the future for sure we'll have to dig in more to your past and um uh how you you know through these news shows also you know bring in relevant i wanted to mention you know you had the story about the uh your your seeing elon in the tesla fremont factory when it was tiny <laughs> when, when the volumes were tiny maybe we could yeah. end with that story again because probably a lot of people still haven't haven't heard that your bike ride through Fremont factory in I don't know what was it 2012 2013 yeah, yeah it's, the no. summer of tw- it's the summer of 2012 yeah so it was, it was during the model s uh launch for uh launch program well going back to the article about how Fremont is now the the largest uh producer uh, uh automobile manufacturing facility in the United States Back then, in the summer of 2012, only a fraction of that facility was used to produce Model S. And the rest of it was this barren industrial <laughs> wasteland. So the way, and it probably to this day, it's so big, it's millions of square feet. So to get from one end of the factory to the other, they had these communal bicycles that you could just leave in these bike stands. So if you need one, you just take it, you'd ride to whatever part of the factory you need to go to, and then you would leave the bike for someone else to use. And, and you know, and that's how that would work. Now, the end of line for Model S was on one side of the plant, but then you also had the receiving end. So like all the aluminum and all the uh, raw materials that had come in Kind of process on one side kind of the plant and then come out the other end well in between those two sides there were just these football field areas of of nothingness of these it almost like look like warehouses or a convention center that 
that was empty. There were no lights on. You just had like the ambient light coming through like the factory factory windows. And, um, and then these old robots from back from the Toyota uh, collaboration with General Motors that occupied, occupied the factory before Tesla, but they'd been dormant for years. So it had this kind of like post-apocalyptic, almost kind of like Blade Runner vibe where, um, so um, where the Tesla factory was, everything was white and red. So the floors were white, the walls were white, the ceilings were white, it had skylights, the robots were all shiny and red. And then it was like, it was like, um, it was like the Wizard of Oz, you'd cross this line and everything was in black and white. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's so funny. And we'd, we'd eat our lunch on these old robots in these, in these, these big expanses of building when, and no one else was around and it's so funny that now that every square foot of that building is packed with shiny new robots anyway so to get, to get to to the story of seeing elon in person for the first time we um we basically were building uh me and a, a, about 12 of us of the new hires uh we're building trailers 22 foot feather light trailers, aluminum trailers that were going to be distributed to test service centers all over the country. We we're building in the, in the back lot of the Fremont factory. And we needed a forklift, actually need two forklifts to lift these trailers off of the huge semi delivery truck that was delivering them. This kind of the British version. Um, and so we're like, oh, we need forklifts. I was like, where are forklifts? Oh, well, receiving must have forklifts on the other side of the factory. So we call over, hey, can we bogart some forklifts? We're like, sure. Do you have anybody that is licensed to operate a forklift? Like, do we have any of that? Yeah, two of the guys on my team happen to be licensed to operate a forklift randomly. They're like, yes, we totally have that. They're like, cool. So uh, me and my buddy, Kieran, who's still with Tesla, he's with the charging team. Um, we get on our bikes and we're going through the factory and um and we we're going through the body and white section of uh model s production line which is kind of like the, the furthest paint on the on the car and um and the engineers would have these coffee tables just full in little folding chairs and they'd just be right on the assembly line with their laptops like the actual engineers of the car would be on the assembly line which again <laughs> is such a huge advantage for tesla where like you know the the where you don't have the factory in in you know you know Mexico or some of the other country it's right there so the manufacturers they can go from their office and then they go out to the floor and they could and they could you know in real time but again it just sh shows how tiny it was back then like <laughs> you're like biking oh yeah just like little there's, fully <laughs> there's, there's some engineers there's on their coffee table with their laptops and. You know, oh, it was so mom big, and pop. It was so huge rigid. empty space between uh, where you were and the the deliveries. You know, yeah. Sent. And speaking how small it was, one of those engineers happened to be Elon Musk, and he was there. Um, you know, sitting he has he has little laptop and riding our bikes by. And this was my first time seeing um, Elon in person and Kieran's. And of course, we're so excited because uh, it's a monumental moment. You know, it's like, wow, that's the Elon Musk. Like sitting right there on the factory floor, you know, whittling away on his on his computer, doing probably very important things. And so, um, and then Jaren's like, hey, let's let's circle back around and drive back. <laughs> so we did. We turned around. We totally creeped. We were like, you know. Yeah. Road past. Uh, so he took but, a slight, you know, three three minute detour. Uh, yeah. Just, but yeah, the but reason, the first, first I mean, the reason it came to mind was just how you described it as so empty and like Armageddon, like you know, like how barren it was, and uh, to think now it's the largest auto production factory in the U.S. Uh, at the time, did you think, oh, this is going to be big one day, or did you think, wow, are they ever going to use all this space? <laughs> it was the picture. That's the dichotomy or, that that or, lived in me because I'm yeah. I, on one end, I'm I'm a I'm a cockeyed optimist. I see potential. Like this can be so awesome. I think that's what brought me to Tesla, and I think that's what uh, made me um, 
gave me hope in, in really tough times. Like when I was working like hundred hour weeks and all yeah. these things, I was like, well, this can be cool. If we can make it work, this is going to be really big. Um, the odds are stacked way, way against us, but if we can do it, it's going to be big. So it was definitely a dichotomy at one end. I was like, gosh, if we're only using a fraction of it for model S, you know, where, where can this go? What is so fascinating, and again, this is a testament to the rate of growth that Tesla experienced then and is still experiencing. And I and I and then when I go to Giga Texas and I've gone there, I was there for the Cyber Rodeo, I was there for the Cyber Truck delivery event. To see the scale of that facility is bonkers. But going back to to Fremont, the as far as their, the growth and the, and the rate of growth. So in 2012, you ha- there's this small sliver that was being used for, for a Model S building up that initial ramp up. You're like, oh, how would they ever fill this space? One year later, I was able to get a little time off and my family went to, to the Bay Area and I went to the, you know back to the Bay Area. It was my first time being in Fremont since the fall of 2012, because in fall of 2012, I went back to the East Coast to the New York market and I helped establish the delivery team in the tri-state. So New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, sometimes we consider it the quad state, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. But I hadn't seen Fremont in about a year. So I hadn't visited Fremont in about a year. So in the fall of 2013, I was able to take my, my, my in-laws and my wife on a tour of Fremont and the big, massive expanse, the thing that was literally the size of like a, a soccer stadium that was empty and dreary and nothing was happening in it and dark was filled. And we would sit and eat lunch. <laughs> uh, was filled with like thousands of aluminum doors, like on these racks, just like row after row after row after row. And it, it was, it looked like um, just this massive fulfillment facility now in, in that section. I remember telling them just 12 months ago, this was completely barren. And now it's this bustling, like manufacturing center in one year, you know, and then, and that's in 2013, it's 11 years later now. And now it's the, uh, that produces the most cars of any manufacturing, auto manufacturing plant in America, which again, if you would have said that, 20,000 jobs, 20,000 people are, are directly related to, to that facility. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, back the sales back then were be, be like this tiny speck that we'd be saying is insignificant compared to now, you know, we'd be like, oh, this is like not, you know, as we were talking earlier about other other models and brands. Um, <clears throat> well, when I toured the factory, um, if we want factory, gosh, what was it? Five years ago or something? Uh, it was similar. Those, those aluminum doors stacked up was was my one of the things that stood out, jumped out to me as well. And it was one of my favorite pictures from there was all these aluminum doors. But even back then, like they were saying, like the factory was packed, they didn't have much more space. And I think <laughs> that I think they're getting um, maybe a, a hundred or a couple hundred thousand more units out of there now uh, a year. But it, anyway, yeah. it's it's just it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's our show. Um, welcome, David. And uh, we'll hopefully be in person for a different format um, next time. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed. If you liked, hit the button, subscribe, hit the bell, donate everything. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Hi, my name is Scott Cooney. I started Clean Technica to promote clean energy and other sustainable alternatives, and for 13 years, we've been moving markets. If we had a nickel for every time someone told us they bought their first EV, solar, e-bike, or fill-in-the-blank clean energy solution, we'd be a cable TV channel by now. But we don't get those nickels. So unfortunately, we could use your help to reach a few more people. If just 1% of our audience chipped in a few bucks a month, we could hire dozens of great journalists and promote all sorts of climate solutions. It's easy. Just go to cleantechnica.com support and sign up with a credit card in seconds. Cancel any time. But we'll be sending out some cool perks too, so I think you'll want to stick around. With your support, we'll keep leading the charge. Thank you so much.